Ever wonder why some of the world's most captivating cars start their journeys a bit unreliable? Welcome to the heart of innovation, or in this case, where the heart used to be. Allow me to take you on a journey into the cosmos of automotive reliability. Let's travel back in time, all the way back to the mid-1970s, a time when oil was becoming scarce, smog regulations were becoming stringent, and manufacturers were exploring ways to provide more fuel-efficient cars that polluted less. Gone were the days of rich-running carburetor cars that were barely more advanced than a modern lawnmower. It was the dawn of a new era in terms of automotive design from an electromechanical perspective. While plastics were becoming prevalent in the interior of cars, they would yet to make their way into the engine bay. As the oil crisis subsided, the smog crisis intensified as more vehicles were making their way onto the road. Air quality in major cities was becoming an issue, especially in the summer months. Something had to be done. Government intervention was needed to ensure health and general quality of life for the citizens of their respective countries. While the task was clear, the approach varied depending on the manufacturer. The first approach was to install smog equipment downstream of the engine to help capture and reburn as much fuel as possible that made it past the exhaust valves. This led to reliability issues and poor performance. It was obvious that this wouldn't be the ultimate solution. Instead, more granular control of the fuel prior to entering the engine was needed. We already know how this story ends. Fuel injection was implemented, but it's not that simple. Fuel injection came in various varieties with different levels of complexity, which led to difficult challenges in terms of implementation. Some manufacturers were ahead of the game, but ultimately reverted back to mechanical fuel injection systems going into the early 80s. But you clicked on this video to hear about BMWs, so let's focus on them and how they journeyed from carbureted cars in the 70s to ultra-advanced direct injection fuel systems that run in the neighborhood of 5,000 PSI. In my opinion, there was a strong correlation to the prevalence of BMWs on the road and the move toward fuel injection with the aid of Bosch. It was now the early 80s and the E33 series was becoming popular. BMW along with other European manufacturers were an early adopter of Bosch's Jetronic fuel injection. In the mid 80s, they implemented L-Jetronic, which included an airflow meter along with a lambda probe to measure stoichiometric fuel ratios, aka an oxygen sensor. While the system might seem primitive today as it still relied on a cold start valve to inject fuel on really cold days, it was so refined compared to carburetor cars with mechanical chokes and rich fuel bias. North American sales were a major contributor to BMW's success. Where did the desire for their cars come from? It was how innovative and refined they were in my opinion. The more they pushed balance, refinement, and power, the more their sales numbers grew exponentially. So the premise was innovation. They drove differently, and it all centered around the heart of the car. That, of course, is the engine. There is a reason to this day that the model for a particular BMW is defined by what engine it has. It used to correlate back to the displacement of the engine, but regardless, most people buy a BMW for the engine that is installed inside. So the pressure was on. What defined them? Innovation. They had to stay one step ahead to impress. A lot of their executive decisions were based around the North American market. Buyers demanded advancement. They were accustomed to excellent driving dynamics, but the engine is what brought people into showrooms and the red line is what made them sign on the dotted line. There was a prestige to the displacement of your engine, something that would seem arbitrary to a non-enthusiast. Take all that and put it on steroids and you end up with the M division, but that's a story for another day. Today I'm talking about why standard BMWs were always special and even non-car enthusiasts knew they had a je ne sais quoi about them. So now it's the early 90s and BMW hit their stride in engine development and fuel control. What was the next defining barrier? Crash safety, cars needed to be structurally more rigid and have crumple zones and age such as airbags and ABS systems to help with survivability. That meant added weight. Couple that with recycling regulations and you start to see lightweight composite materials making their way into the engine compartments, especially on the cooling system side. The heat cycling demands of plastics were a bit of an uncharted territory for all manufacturers, but eventually they dialed that in. As we enter into the late 90s and early 2000s, this is where fuel consumption targets were being aggressively imposed. So instead of entering a golden age of reliability and maximum performance from naturally aspirated cars, we enter the age of reduced displacement with as much horsepower as possible. Various technologies were implemented. To waste less fuel and only fire the fuel injector when the intake valve is open, cam sensors were utilized. To give you the down low torque of a larger displacement engine without the trade-off of reduced air intake at high RPMs, variable valve typing was introduced on the intake cam. 
To meet emissions regulations and aid in performance, valve timing was introduced on the exhaust can. Now it's the mid-2000s and V8s are no longer considered acceptable for mass production. To deliver V8 performance but provide 600 fuel economy, turbocharging was introduced. This was a tall order, but thankfully direct injection technology came out to make this viable from an emission standpoint. Now it's the early 2010s and further innovation is required to stay ahead of the game. Valvetronic was introduced to vary the intake cam lift and eliminate the restriction of the throttle body plate. Now there's a new demand, four cylinders that feel like six cylinders. This is achieved via twin scroll turbocharger technology. So now it's the early 2020s. And yes, we are at the point where the focus can be put on reliability as there are no major changes to the engine designs to factor in. Instead, there's a shift toward electrification. So imagine a scenario where another brand would focus less on innovation and maybe stay 10 years behind, but focus on iterative improvements that make a platform ultra reliable. Sound familiar? Maybe some known Japanese brands? Would you have bought a BMW if the engine didn't get your heart racing? Did the engine stand for almost all the reasons you wanted one? If they were 20% less engaging to drive but ultra reliable, would you have bought one? I don't think most would, but now you can have your cake and eat it too. So enjoy it while you can, as 10 years from now, chances are you'll be considering a fully electric car. Even though the focus is now on reliability, they still are a good 10 years ahead in terms of ICE innovation, and it shows. Look at the B58. Let's give this thing a first start. running great now nice and smooth i'm just bleeding the cooling system still a little bit loud because i got to put a muffler back on it that's right over there it has a muffler delete currently i always imagined this would be a fun spec an n20 with a six speed because of how the torque comes on now the way the torque hits on an n20 is more fun than a b48 in my opinion because it comes on a little earlier it seems so you may be wondering why would i go through all the effort to save this car and it's because of how rare the spec is it's a manual of course and that is quite rare i read that there's like less than two percent of them even came as a manual especially with the n20 the way this thing is optioned is interesting as well it's got the upgraded sports steering wheel cic navigation heads up display blind spot monitoring surround view cameras rear power sunshade it's got bilstein b14 coilovers as an upgrade it's got lcid tail lights it's got Xenon HID headlights, projectors. So there's probably other features that I'm not thinking of right now, but you know, it's definitely well optioned. It's got all the tech, yet it doesn't have a sunroof, so it's a slick top, which in my opinion is a nice thing, especially on an enthusiast spec. Oh yeah, it even has BAV audio upgraded sound, so it sounds pretty amazing. So someone cared about this car, made it look as good as they could, and it's only got 100,000 miles. Now that I've refreshed the engine, I did everything you could imagine. So it's good for another 100,000 at least. Transmissions are reliable. Obviously, it's a manual, brand new clutch, you name it. So this will be a perfect fun car for somebody. It's got the upgraded timing chain now, so you don't have to worry about that flaw. I'll be reaching out to Joel from Raleigh Motorsports to get the body detail, full polish, and ceramic coat, etc. So this was a dismantler's dream in terms of an F30 spec, especially because it was a full manual swap. It was worth a lot more money and parts in a way than what I've done in terms of putting a good motor into it. I could have just sold that motor all refreshed for probably $4,000 and then I could have parted this thing out and done quite well. So if that sounded like a bit of a sales pitch, yes it is. I'm putting miles on the car to make sure everything's perfect on it, but it's going to be offered for sale. If you guys are interested in a very rare F30, fun to drive, I'll put my contact information in the description of the video. This thing handles very well. The Bilstein B14s are at their highest setting at this moment, so it could handle better. I'll put a picture up of how it looked when it was dumped. It looked quite nice. I just raised it up so that I could get it over my lift to change the engine. So my asking price is $13.5 for this car. It's about the top of retail, but considering that all the maintenance has been done, you're going to have a good 50,000 miles of trouble-free driving before you'll even have to think about any kind of major maintenance. So it's a good value, all things considered. Now, if you like this video, best thing you can do for the channel and for support is to go watch other content that I've made. Thanks for watching.